has experienced Strength and Hope with us for approximately 45 minutes. We ask out of respect for our speaker to please remain seated until he is finished. It is my great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Brent. My name is Brent. I'm an alcoholic. It's good to be here. Uh, I hate to give Bob here more face time, uh, <laughs> but my last in-person meeting was in Sun Valley, Idaho in July. So maybe you were there. Maybe not, but <laughs> right, I would have remembered. How could you miss Bob? Uh, Anyway, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I want to get the thank yous out of the way. Thank Mike B. for uh, for inviting me to speak tonight, and I want to thank all the people with service commitments. Uh, this meeting is really consistent, and it has a lot of structure. And for me and my AA program, I like meetings with a lot of structure, and uh, so I appreciate everything everybody does every week at this meeting. Uh, thank my higher power for my sobriety. Um, I believe I have a partnership with my higher power. Um, and I want to thank AA and, uh, and, and, and Bill and Dr. Bob. Like, I really pay attention to how it all started, and, you know, I believe that I'm here by seconds and inches, a second here, an inch there, and you'd have a different speaker tonight, and it's the same for all of you, a second here and a second there, and there'll be somebody else sitting in your seat tonight. If you think about it, it's true for everybody. And so I really feel that uh, it's precious uh, that, I'm, that I'm standing here. I shouldn't be standing here um, like you. and I'm no different than you. So anyway, I'm, I'm feeling pretty grateful. I had a great day. I hung out with my eight-year-old daughter. Uh, we, we had some errands that we ran. We cooked a couple big artichokes, dipped them in mayo, uh, you know, ate the heart. And uh, I'm an expert at carving out artichoke hearts, which I did it again tonight perfectly. And... Uh, <laughs> And I had a really, and I'm finishing my day here, and then I'm taking my former wife and my daughter out to Frozen Franny's for a little yogurt. Um, it's an outside issue, Frozen Franny's. If you don't like it, I apologize for not. But you're, but you're welcome to come join us. Um, my goal is to be the best ex-husband that ever uh, lived in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and I learned, I learned from people uh, that were that sponsored me. I learned from a guy named Billy Smith um, in Las Vegas when I lived there. He he said, I mow my, my former wife's, uh, and I don't call it, I try not to call her ex, but I, I mow my former wife's lawn every week, and I go fix things at her house um, just to try to keep, not to pat myself on the back, but to keep my resentments as low as possible, <laughs> right? Um, so that's that. Uh, I want to welcome all the new people. You know, if you're, if you're in your first 30 days or your first year or your first couple years and you're having a hard time doubting if you should be here, uh, I identify with that. I do that too. And I hope, I hope you don't consider it a mistake that you joined Alcoholics Anonymous, but rather uh, a sign of good judgment. Uh, and I, I struggled when I came in the rooms. Boy, I was in and out. I'm a relapser by trade. Um, I get the thought to drink or use. And a team of horses couldn't keep me. You know, calling calling your sponsor was you know that was like a that was like a laughable suggestion to me. So I'm I'm uh, so I really identify with relapsers in particular. You don't I'm not saying you have to relapse, but that's my story. I'll get into that a little bit. So um, if you if you and I'll share in a general way what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. If you looked, I, I was born in Oregon and moved to Minnesota, so the first nine years of my life were Oregon and Portland and, and, and uh, the Minneapolis, a suburb of Minneapolis. And if you looked at me from the outside or you looked at my family from the outside, it would seem like everything was great. Uh, it was like the wonder years, if any of you remember that show. I'd get my bike in the morning in the summer and go fishing all day. Um, you know, come home, you know, back in those days, you'd leave in the morning and come home at dusk. There was no issue with that. I'm just gone all day long, but usually fishing by myself. Um, that's a, that's an early sign that, uh, that I didn't like to be around people. I like to isolate. But it, in any event, my family was pretty normal. My parents had one martini uh, a night, Monday through Friday. They had a mixture uh, chilled in the refrigerator. They'd make it on Sunday night. It would last them the whole week. They'd each have one. There was no alcoholism in my family. To my knowledge, I'm the only alcoholic in my immediate family. Um, I might I have a, a few doubts about a couple 
uh, relatives, but uh, that's not my call. But there was no yelling, screaming, fighting, hitting, no abuse. It was a, it was a, it was a, it was a, a 50s, 60s, and 70s family. Not a lot of hugging, and not a lot of loving, and not a, you know, not. Uh, there was some, you know, there just wasn't a lot of that given out, but there wasn't a lot of bad stuff either. Uh, and I can tell you, after coming to AA and hearing a lot of people speak, uh, that I always felt different, right? I always felt different. And looking back, I always felt less than. And that is the core of my disease, is I feel, and I am, less than. And I'll do anything I can to make myself feel better than, whether it's alcohol or drugs or sex or gambling or eating anger, traveling, whatever it may be, right? I'll try to stuff those feelings into a nice little box and just cover them up with whatever I can find to cover them up with. And the problem with doing that is it's a short-term solution to a long-term problem. And by the way, some people never come into AA and have this opportunity to, to open up that box and deal with it, right? I mean, that's why, I don't know about you, but that I just kept, I just kept drinking on that box, just pu putting more and more and more stuff in that box. So growing up, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of great communication, uh, you know, but we, 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 we did okay as a family. I played sports. I was a leader. I was team captain, kickball. Um, we had a good kickball team. And, uh, and, and, and in high school, I was team captain of the basketball teams. And, uh, um, you know, I was a good boy. I tried to do, I tried to do, uh, I tried to do good things. Uh, I didn't get in any trouble. My older brother was kind of a screw up, and I just like I just didn't do what he did, and I didn't get in trouble. Uh, I got you know BC average. I was just like a vanilla kid, and uh, somewhere uh, between my sophomore and junior year, uh, something changed, and that is that I drank a bottle of Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill. Uh, twist off cap. Now. I've been to a lot of AA meetings, and I've heard a lot of speakers, and it is in the top five of first drinks. Absolutely. <laughs> I've done my own little polling. Budweiser and, and, and uh, Schnapps is up there, you know, slow gin, like all that crap. Like, not you younger people, right? You probably just started slamming dope. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we, we, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I kid, I kid. So I drank that bottle of Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill on the on the on, on the 50 yard line of La Cunada High School, with a guy named Mark Garvey, and uh, I really never talked to that guy ever again. But for some reason, I chose, and I don't remember the circumstances. He was kind of like a bad boy, and I was a good whatever. We just like I don't know how I ended up there. I, I've tried to remember. I can't. I drank that bottle, and it was just you know I felt relieved. And up to that point, I was a skinny kid. I had an acne issue. I had glasses and contacts. And, and I'd ask a girl to dance. Like, I couldn't get off the wall and say, will you please dance with me? I couldn't say it. I go, what? I remember being at parties and go, oh. like, I couldn't. It's not funny. It sucked. <laughs> what are you laughing at? And so when I drank, I could, I could, I said, will, will you dance with me, baby? You know, whatever. Like, I was a completely different person when I drank and so you know I you know and, and Billy Smith I'll probably reference him a couple times he he explained that some people when they start drinking it's it's an immediate decline into alcoholism and other people it's a slow gradual I mean everybody's different right and we all have our stories and and, and mine was a slow gradual decline I drank for about 15 years I started around 15 years old and my last drink when I was 31 um, I started I started with, with, with alcohol and I ended with alcohol and crack. In fact, I, was, I used to, I, I ran with the Bloods and the Crips. <laughs> what? <laughs> you don't believe me? <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll rephrase it. I was a customer of the Bloods and the Crips. <laughs> I said for years I ran with the Bloods. That's such a lie. Like. <laughs> I was in motel rooms in Watson, South Central, though, getting the shit kicked out of me just to get high one more time. I'm so lucky to be alive. It's like a war zone, and those poor, those poor people live in those neighborhoods. It was terrible, and I was part of the problem, and I'm really, really lucky that I got out of there. It gets me emotional to think of the shit that I did down there. 
Um, so anyway, I had that bottle of Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill, and, and then, uh, you know, then I remember my first joint, and I remember, you know, having that amber-colored little bottle with a black cap on it in my pocket and feeling so powerful with a little spoon in my pocket, so powerful. And, uh, and even in my early 20s, I don't know if anybody's experienced this, but w when I used to go... Like if I was going out to, you know, I, I, my first, my first illegal drink was at the Loch Ness Monster Pub in, in Pasadena. It was like, it was like the greatest bar God ever created. It was like, it was so much fun. And, uh, and, and I was like a bar drinker in my twenties. And, and when I started to do a little blow and I didn't like weed, like I, I, I also want to say this. I was, I thought I was like, cool. I was the worst out. I, I was such a lightweight. I, 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 I took a quaalude and I sat on a toilet for four hours. I could not get up. I smoked Thai weed the first time. I've only, one time. I, uh, I couldn't. I was so out of it. I took mushrooms. Or I'd, I'd smoke weed. I'd hide in a bush for three hours. I just, I didn't, I was so bad and I thought I was so badass and I was just bad at drinking and using. We think we're so great, but we're here. So we're not that great. I hate to tell you, right? And I also want to say that there's people that drank more than me that are not alcoholic. It's not how much, it's why. Remember I said earlier, less than, right? There's guys that drank more than me that they're just drinking a lot and they're like, oh, my liver hurts a little bit. I'm going to quit. And they quit and they have a happy rest of their life. There's a lot of people like that. In fact, I believe there's people in AA that aren't alcoholic. How do you like that? Not everybody that comes in here is alcoholic. Glad everybody's here. Just my experience. Don't want to get controversial though. So <laughs> I'll stick to the format. Um, so... So I started, you know, uh, feeling pretty good, and I, I, I went to Pasadena uh, Junior College and, and uh, Pasadena City College, I should say. It was a lot of fun, and I, I met, you know, a couple dealers, and it was just, I, ha I started ha having a lot of fun, and I came out of my shell, and I, and I started working for a ski company at 18 years old, and I got a pretty high position at that company at 22 years old, and running around the country and going to college, and I had a full-time job, and, and I was really good in sales, um, and, I, and, I, and I had an expense account, and I just, I just jacked that sucker up wherever I went and abused it. I had to sit down with these three multimillionaires and make amends to them, and they took my check um, <laughs> because they knew, right, they knew that they knew my intention was to make things right with them. So that money meant nothing to them, but me making amends meant a lot to them, right? It was one of those great amend experiences that I had. So I'm working for the ski company. I'm traveling all over, and again, on the outside, I'm holding it together. and the inside, I'm dying. I'm sneaking around doing really creepy things at night. A, a few hookers here and there, uh, you know, uh, picking up women wherever I could at bars, um, you know, I'm hanging out at bars till closing and then driving around looking to score some, narc some, some weed or some drugs, not narcotics, but some weed or some coke or something like that. And I was kind of living this double life, which I think a lot of us do too. And I was like, for those of you old enough, there was this, sh this, this show, this is a great Sunday night show called The Ed Sullivan Show. <laughs> And they had a guy come out, I don't know his name, but he, he was a plate spinner. And he put these wood dowels, and he'd run around, and he'd spin the plates. And he, the whole stage, and he's running, and he's just, and that was what I was doing. And then the plates started to fall, right? I got two DUIs, two plates fell. I remember, I don't have time to tell this story, but has anybody been incarcerated at L.A. County Jail? Okay, good. So it is a hellhole. Okay, it's, it's worse than San Quentin, I think. Well... We'd have to ask Danny T that, but, 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 but it, it was, I was there for two days and I thought it was two years. It was, and, uh, I, I, I got out. Um, so I'll tell the story. So, so I got arrested on that black and white bus driving around LA with the bars on the windows that were all familiar with those going from jail to jail to jail in all those cities. And then it funneled me down to. Uh, L.A. County Jail, and then, and then you're processed, and then you know I've never like I'm just a good 
I'm just a good boy, and um, I'm being processed, and I'm with another white kid with red hair. He was like my savior. So we're on the bus, you know, and then we're like, and we have to take our clothes off, and they, they throw this white shit on us so we don't get lice, right? And, and then, we're, then we're put into a, we're shoved into a room, and then we're shoved into a smaller room, and then you're just like this, you know, up against all these other men. And then I went into my little bunk room, um, and it really was like a prison, metal doors and everything. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I remember that first night I was like, I, I was scared, like, you know, I, I was afraid. I grew up in La Cunada, California. I shouldn't be here. I just had a couple drinks last night. Too many, a couple too many, I agree, but I shouldn't be in jail. Like, this is just, you know, whatever. What's, what, what about your, letting you go in your own recognizance and stuff like that? So, so the next morning, like, they wake you up at, like, 5 a.m., and you got to take a shower, and I was afraid to take a shower because of what I'd seen on all the TVs. Like, it wasn't going to bend down and grab the soap or anything. Like, I was really, I, like, in and out of the shower, and, and then, you know, you're in, and it was so overcrowded. There was two bunks and cots, so there was, like, eight guys in this, like, little thing in the, and the, and, the, and, the, and the toilet was disgusting. I mean, it was just like, and you're in this room, and you're hearing people yell, and it's like Shawshank. I'm in Shawshank Redemption. I'm like, I'm thinking like I'm the next guy that's going to go, right? <laughs> so, so, seconds and inches. So, so we, so don't judge me, okay, about what I'm about to tell you. So, so then I go to lunch that next day, and it's like, there's guards with shotguns in there. I'm not, I'm not fucking with you. There's like, there's shotguns and there's, there's, there's sheriffs and they're everywhere. And you're in the, and you're in the mess hall and you're, and you're not, there's no, there's no sound. It's just hearing the, whatever, I can't remember if it was, it probably wasn't metal utensils, but you just heard people eating and I couldn't take it anymore. And I got up and said, I don't belong here. I shouldn't be here. God's honest truth. I haven't told this story in a long time. So, so this guy comes up to me and, you know, <laughs> sit down, my man. They're just like, you know, yelling at me, veins, like, and I stood my ground. <laughs> and, I, and I calmed down. I said, look, man, I, I don't belong here, bro, to the, to the sheriff. And I said, I got a normal job. I'm a good guy. I got drunk last night. I don't know why, why, why I'm here. And, it, and he said, where do you work? And I, and I knew, I knew at that instant I was getting out. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. And I told him I worked for the ski company. And he said, oh, yeah? He goes, I used to work at Sports LTD. And I go, Bergie's your boss. I know Bergie. He goes, yeah, come on. And he, took, he got me out of the mess hall. He took me right out. Now, I don't know how many sheriffs there are in L.A. County Jail, what, 500? I don't know. The one that I say I don't belong here to is my buddy all of a sudden, right? And I get, I get, I get out six hours. So that's my, that's my jail story. So. Now, I'm a tough guy. I'm a tough guy. I did my time. Uh, so, so, so back to what it was like. So, so I got a couple DUIs and, and – uh, and my life was spiraling, and then I, I smoked some, uh, some, some crack cocaine. That's part of my story, and that was really, you know, uh, jet fuel for me. It was, it was what I've been looking for. You know, we all find what we're looking for. That was, that was what I was looking for. When I mixed it with alcohol, it was great. And I really did start hanging out in Watson, South Central, because that's where all the action was. And I'd go to a motel for two or three or four days at a time, and I would get robbed, and I would get beat up, and I'd stay. I got my face cracked open with glass. I have a scar on my lip. I did, you know, and I was just spiraling and spiraling. And another seconds and inches story. So I worked at this building called the California Mart, which is a few blocks from uh, the Midnight Mission. I used to go visit Clancy after I got sober. He's a couple blocks down the street. So I worked at the California Mart downtown. I had a showroom on the fourth floor. <clears throat> and by this time, I'm not in the ski business. I'm in the apparel business, and I'm selling cravats. You know what a cravat is? It's a necktie. I sold I sold neckties for 35 years. I've sold a lot of neckties in my time. And uh, it was a great business, and, but I was like, you know, during the day working and at night, I'd go on down to Watson South Central, like really living. And you can only keep those plates spinning for so long when you're doing stuff like that. I was spending every dime I had. I had no money. I didn't pay the IRS. Um, my parents were worried about me. My brothers were worried about me. And, you know, <clears throat> I like AA like, 
You know, if you read if you read the book, there you know it's, it says like, oh, there's suggestions. Like I don't believe, I don't believe that for me. This is do or die. It's a hundred percent for me. You know, there's there's a lot of absolutes in the book. If you you know if you I mean there's hundreds of them. I think I've never counted. You know, there are no middle of the road solutions. There's no middle of the road solutions. Half measures avail us nothing. So if you put 50% in, you get Zippo, right? So you got to put 100% in here, right? Who cares to admit complete defeat, right? There's a lot of absolutes in here. And I'm so glad for those absolutes. I had really, really strong sponsorship when I was new. And they were, they were on my ass about this stuff. Like there was no, you know, I'm, I, before AA, I was a half measure guy. You could, that could have been my middle name, half measure, like I did everything. And if it got too difficult, I just shift and do something else. And if you shift and do something else in AA, you could die. I've seen it. We've all seen it, those of us with time. So I'm in this, I'm in the California Mart, I'm in my late 20s, and, uh, and I go down to get a cup of coffee. And there's, there's an escalator system, you know, from the, from, the, from the first floor all the way up to the 10th floor, whatever, and they're, they're crossing. So if you're going down, you can see somebody go up through a little portal, a little porthole between, the, they're right next to each other. And I'm going down, and, I, and I, I don't know how I recognized him. I don't know how I saw him, but it was, I wouldn't say my friend. It was a guy I went to high school with named Carl, and I really didn't like him. I remember in my yearbook, he said, Dear Brent, have a good life. Like, that was it. And uh, <laughs> he, was, he reminds me of Matthew McConaughey. He's really handsome, curt, blonde, tan, funnier than heck, charisma. And, and he was going down, and I'm so codependent, even though I didn't like him. I'm like, Carl, Carl, hi. <laughs> I ran back up and tracked him down, and, and we're talking. I, I could, I could, I could. I could drive you to where we were standing in that building right now, and I, can, I could reiterate that conversation to you right now, and I will. And, and he's like, what's going on? And I feel, I don't know if you're like this, but when I was getting high and running and gunning, I feel like the next day people could look at me and just know what I did the night before. Like, just like here, I was with, you know, her, and I was doing it. Like, I felt like you could just see right through me. And he's talking to me, and I haven't seen him since we were 18 years old. And we graduated from high school. I'm like 28, 29, probably 28 when I saw him. Hey, what's going on? Da 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 da. And I'm like, every oh good, I'm doing good. I got a showroom here, you know. And I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm sober and Alcoholics Anonymous and Cocaine Anonymous. Two years. Now, why on earth did he say? It? By the way, if I left for that cup of coffee, a minute. Or 30 seconds later than I did, you'd have a different speaker tonight. I would not be here. I call Carl every year on my birthday and thank him for my sobriety. He saved my life. So he said, I'm sober in AA and, 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 and CA and da 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 da. And he's like, here's my number. Like, I, did he, I don't know what, like, I, I've asked him. I go, did I? He goes, no, I just, you know, I just being myself. Okay. So I call him two years later. I kept his number, called him two years later. And my sc another absolute, our scorecards read zero. Okay, it didn't read three, it read zero. <laughs> absolute. And I called him. The game, I had no game left. I had no, I, had, I didn't have anything left. So I called him up, and uh, Michael liked this. So I called him up, and he said, well, there's a meeting in Palm Springs. There's, there." He didn't say there's a roundup. It was it was it was Clancy's roundup. He goes, "There's a meeting in Palm Springs. Can you go this weekend?" He goes, "Can you not?" <laughs> he said, "It was it was Wednesday." He said, "Can you not drink tonight?" Now nobody ever said anything like that. Like we don't. That's not normal vernacular with people. Not like, "Hey, can you not drink tonight?" No, my like this. It's only within the walls of AA. And I I said, "Yeah." He didn't say. And I'm not trying to be funny. He didn't say anything about Thursday night. And I got wasted Thursday night. I went down to Watts and did my thing, and I, I had an appointment the next day. I'm dating myself at Miller's Outpost. And uh, I went out to Miller's Outpost uh, in Ontario. Then I headed out to Palm Springs, and I got there, and I was not a vision for you. I, I had been in motel rooms a lot. I was green and gray. I didn't have any color. I was bloated. It was bad. And I got to this, the Wyndham Hotel, and I'm like, 
wow, what? Like people were saying, like total, hi, hi, you know, how are you? My name's John. And it was just like really bad. And, uh, <laughs> and I went up to my, Carl, had, you know, God, I mean, if you're new, I just want to cordially welcome you to AA. You know, the group conscience of AA is that we want you to stay. No matter what's going on, where you're from, who you are, what your background is, the group conscience is we want you to stay. There may be some assholes in here, whatever. I'm an asshole sometimes, but but we want you to stay. And I do really cordially welcome you and hope you find here what I found here and what other people have found here. It's available to everybody. And and these guys love me that, you know, fuck. <clears throat> I went up to the room and, and Carl wasn't there, but this guy named Jim M was there and he goes, come on, let's go sit on the balcony. I mean, Carl must have updated him and he's like, so what's going on? And I, I didn't know it. I did a fifth step. I said, I'm doing this. Like I, nobody knew I was so ashamed of what I was doing. And for some reason, I just like told him all this stuff and he's like nodding his head. And then whatever, I finished talking and he told me some of the stuff he was doing. You know, and it's the most powerful thread that binds us, right? The concept of identification, right? I identify, I don't, I don't identify with my little brother. I love him. I don't identify. He doesn't identify. I, I could identify with a stranger in five minutes, in three minutes, in 30 seconds, in their, if they're in recovery, if they're in so Jim M, man, that was great. That was great. And uh, the first speaker for that Friday night, uh, June 10th, 1988, and you can look it up in the archives, was Clancy I. And he spoke. He wasn't the Saturday night speaker. He was the Friday night speaker. And I don't remember who the Saturday night speaker was, but I looked across the aisle right where I was sitting. I looked across the aisle, seconds and inches. There's 3,000 people in the room. And there's AJ. And AJ was, you know, the brother of my boss at the ski company. And I knew AJ for years. He's sober five years. I'm like, Are AJ? He became my sponsor. And I jumped into AA and went back to LA, stopped at my parents and told them I, 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 what, that, I, that I went to AA meetings over the weekend and I was never going to drink again. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and I stayed sober for nine months, and the, for three months, I'm sorry. And in those three months, I became president of the L.A. chapter of Alcoholics Anonymous. I learned very quickly, and uh, I was running the whole show. And uh, I'm kidding. And, uh, you know, I just I knew everything too quickly, and my ego got in the way. And, and uh, I, I stayed sober for – and I was doing everything, by the way. I was going to meetings, commitments. A lot. I had a commitment every day, um, reading the book. Uh, I just – you know, I forget the most. I forgot the most, or I didn't learn the most important thing is that is I can't pick up the first drink, and I kept picking up the first drink. So I got 30 days, then I got 60, then I got 30, then I um, then I got five and a half months, and then I drank again. And, and I, I found out on my 10 year anniversary that when I went out that last time, my sponsor Alan cried because he thought I was going to die. Like he was so upset that I went out again. Like we don't know the harm. <laughs> And I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty, but like I didn't know the harm I was causing people. I was so selfish and self-centered. On my 10th birthday, he told me that. He goes, I'm so proud of you, 10 years. He goes, I remember that last week where I was crushed. You know, fuck, it's hard to hear. Um, so I came into AA in that, you know, on June, on June 16th, <coughs> uh, 1989, uh, a guy named Kenny Goltz, Kenny G, uh, showed up, called me in the morning, and convinced me to go to the Rodeo Drive meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills on a Friday night. I went to that meeting, an hour and a half meeting. Al Sines was the speaker. Hi, Al. He's up in the big meeting in the sky. He used to tap the big book on his head for like five minutes, and it was he was the greatest spe one of the greatest speakers I've ever heard. He was the speaker, but it's an hour and a half meeting, and there was a 30 minutes of birthdays and uh, housekeeping and then a break and then the main speaker and during the break and again I could drive you to the tree I was leaning against there's 500 people in the meeting and they're all outside smoking and grab ass and doing whatever we do at Rodeo it's pretty fun and uh, it wasn't fun that night and uh, 
I'm leaning against this tree and a guy came up and did what we're supposed to do and he stuck his hand out to me and he said hi my name's Ken it happened to be two Ken's saved my life in that day it's kind of weird but he said hi my name's Ken he had red hair so I call him redheaded Ken and uh, he said my name's Ken I'm glad you're here and, and I just I did not want to talk to this guy and to my recollection nobody else came up to me on that break and maybe they did maybe they didn't um, I just remember him and he invited me to a meeting the next night and uh, every uh, bone in my body wanted to say no and I said yes and uh, whatever the meeting happened I went home and uh, next night I went to the meeting It was the drug and alcohol center on Santa Monica Boulevard it's no longer in existence it was the two-hour AA meeting and I get there and Ken cordially welcomed me Brent good to see you like Mike Bennett did tonight. Good, good to see you. I'm glad you're here. Can I get you anything? Have it, sit, can I get you a coffee, Brent? Like, where does that happen, right? And I felt safe, right? Even though I had one day of sobriety and I screwed up one more time, I'm starting all over again. And people that I came in with are taking one-year birthday cakes, and I've got one day. And he sits me in the front. He asked me to read Chapter 5, which is kind of fucked up of him. I didn't think that was very nice that I had to get up and... <laughs> taking advantage of a newcomer. Come on, you just stand at the door and greet people. What? So anyway, this guy named John James spoke, and you know he gave me a birthday cake every year for the first 25 years. Oh, by the way, I'm, my sobriety is June 16th, 1989. I'm 62 years old. I'm 31 years sober. I have an eight-year-old daughter, and, uh, and I've got a really full life thanks to A. I forgot. I like to give the stats. Oh, that's fine. Stop. That's like clapping for a diabetic giving, taking their insulin every day. Oh, good job. For taking your insulin. No, I appreciate it. So, so I go to this meeting, and John James says something. And he said, and I hope I can get through to maybe one or two people. He said, in order to maintain long-term sobriety. By the way, let me just pause. This is the what happened part. Right? What it was like, I told you. I'm not going to have enough time to tell you what it's like now too much. But that I love the what happened part in people's story. Like, this is where this is the magic, right? This is like, click. Oh, got it. So he said, in order to maintain long-term sobriety, you must do two things. One, and you've all heard this before, uh, admit to your innermost self that you're an alcoholic. And two, willing to go to any length to get sober and to stay sober. And uh, the big book says a little bit differently, but that's, but that's what he said. And I went home that night, and I had a spiritual experience in my crappy little apartment in West Hollywood. And uh, I started screaming and crying and yelling, and uh, it was like a, what is it called? What was that? Um, like I was, um, the devil was sucked out of me or something. Like I just, I stood up and I felt this strong wind blow through me, and I got chills over my body, and I have not had a, 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 a glancing one second thought of picking up a drink or a drug uh, since that night. And I thought about it every single day. And it's, it was just sucked. And I, I woke up the next day and I knew I was never going to drink or eat again, ever. Like, there's, like I'm not going to say there's no way. It's just like, it's, it's like the hiccups. The hiccups, just, they, they just went away. That just went away. That thought just went away. And uh, I was at the State Line Retreat, which is a great retreat in Las Vegas. I just found out they're having it again this year. I'm probably not going to go, but I go to the State Line Retreat. I've been, I think, 15 straight years. It's a, it's a, it's a three-day. They call it the Woodstock of AA, and there's just they fly speakers in from all around the country, and they each speak on a step. It's fabulous. And and this guy spoke last year, and he 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 he, he talked about this guy named Harry Tebow, and. Um, and when he was speaking, he told me, I, 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 he goes, I read this book called The Collected, Collected Writings of Harry. And I, I'm learning, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on that, uh, I almost mentioned it. I'm online while he's speaking, searching, and I find the book and I ordered it right, right when the guy was talking. So I, I got home and it was there and I read it. And Harry Tebow, there was a lot of non-alcoholics that helped AA. You know, Dr. Silkworth wasn't an alcoholic and Harry Tebow wasn't, but Harry Tebow was Bill Wilson's psychiatrist. And Harry Tebow was like the, one of the first, if not the first, psychiatrist that said alcoholism is a disease, 
right? He was one of the first, in the early 1900s. He's like, he was brilliant. And this book is so beautiful. It's got some really great stuff in there. There's a chapter on, 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 on bottoms and surrenders. And I never really understood the difference between a bottom and a surrender. And uh, I always, you know, step three, like surrender. By the way, fun fact, the word surrender is not in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous one time. It's not in the 12 by 12 one time. Yet it's like one of the top three tenets of our program. Surrender, surrender, surrender. But it's kind of odd that it's not in the big book or the 12 by 12. I don't know why. Maybe Bill thought we were a little too sensitive to surrender. Like wave that now. I'm not, we can't tell alcoholic to surrender. So he uses all sorts of different words. You're delusional, right? Whatever. But <clears throat> so, so I'm going to try and do my best to explain because it really made sense to me when I, when I read this and that. So, so, and, and I can apply it to my life because to my, my, my career in AA because I, I came into AA and I drank after 90 and 1630, like I said, and I was fully surrendered. You know, I was fully surrendered. And I know I have friends in here that had, that are re like the same thing. Like I was fully, and then I drank again. Why? Right? Why? Why do I keep relapsing? And I can't speak for anybody else but myself. So what I read in this book was that, you know, the, the, the part before the surrender is the bottom. So whatever, I hit my bottom uh, many, many times, like a lot of us have. I hit my bottom. I made the surrender. Yeah, I'm surrendering. I'm an alcoholic. I concede to my innermost self, blah, blah, blah. And then I start going to meetings, and my ego comes back. Right? And it's so subtle. I think my, my opinion, my experience is anybody that relapses, it's, it's your ego. It, it, the ego is involved one way or the other. So, so, to, so, so I haven't had a drink for 31 years. So, so, I, so, so what has to replace, and it's not easy for me, what the, 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 what's replacing the ego is humility. So, right? so if I lose my humility about June... 17th, 1989, when I hit the knee. Yeah. If I forget that moment and that humility that I had, I've, I believe I'm going to drink again. Now, I surrendered to my marriage and it didn't work. I've surrendered to a lot of things and taken it back because my freaking ego gets in the way every single time just because we're in recovery and we're do, trying to do the right thing. And, you know, I don't know, again, speaking for myself, my ego is my, is my, is my enemy. It, 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 it gets me into all my trouble. But a few things in my life, I've really uh, accept the bottom. So I try to remember the bottom, and then I can surrender to that bottom. And then I have to have the humility to keep going to meetings, to keep calling my sponsor, to keep working the steps, to keep helping. Right? That's the, that's the act of humility is be, for me, is being involved, being an active member in Alcoholics Anonymous. That is my humility, to get on my knees every morning. I've, 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 I do contemplative prayer meditation almost every morning. You know, it's really, I have a morning routine that I started my first year of sobriety. I still do it every single morning, 10 minutes to an hour, depending on the vibe that I'm getting. Um, so anyway, I wanted to talk about that a little bit, and, and uh, I appreciate you letting me talk about that book that I read. It's I don't know if it's AA-approved literature, so I hope I don't go to AA jail tonight for talking about that. <laughs> um, so my time is up in a couple minutes, and, and uh, <clears throat> you know I have a really full life today, and, and I don't know if my New Jersey friends, um, uh, hey, AJ, oh, there's Alan. He came to the meeting, my first sponsor. <laughs> wow. <sighs> I can't believe you came, bro. <laughs> Saved my life. His wife still reminds me, God, that first week Brett back, Brett, you were bad. Like she, <laughs> Every time I see her, she just reminds me of how bad. And she goes, you're a miracle. Then she, like, you're, you know. Wow, how special is that, AJ? Uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm really, really uh, blessed, and I have a good life, and I don't do it perfectly, but... Um, I have a chance, you know, and, and I hope, you know, I say this, you know, sometimes that in my, 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 in my deathbed, my, my dying week, my dying day, I'm going to be reading something, uh, some, some spirit, something 
I'm not religious. I'm, I, I just I try to stay on the path and try to read this stuff and absorb this stuff and do the best I can. And, 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 I, and, I, and I love it. I love recovery. I love what it's done for me. I love what it's done for those around me. And, and I'm truly blessed. And thank you for letting me share with you tonight. Let's thank Brent one more time. Outstanding.